Okay, so let's talk about uh, what's going on, what's been going on at Ormond Beach. The first thing to say by way of introduction, we'll talk about Ormond, but really I think, I don't really consider Ormond a thing. I consider it part of a larger wetland complex. So it's one part that we, because of our land use decisions, have sort of put a board, uh, uh, divided up the land. But really I consider Magoo Lagoon, Ormond Beach, th th that whole complex just one contiguous wetland. So I usually talk about them as one is one thing. Um, these are some pictures over the last 10, 15 years. That's my son when he's a little younger. Um, at, uh, in this case, this picture was at a screening of a documentary about some of the heroes of the coast. Uh, up on the right is a Savior's Road Task Force, which is, anybody live in Oxnard? You guys know where Savior's Road is? Right, so big, big main thoroughfare that goes basically from the beach inland. And that task force was originally set up when the city was going to, was proposing some stuff to change the road, train, change the road alignment, make it look sort of ugly and this and that. So this citizens group formed, a, completely grassroots, and they formed to provide some comments and hopefully change the city's attitude about that, that uh, particular road. And then it's, it's morphed, so it's continued. So now these folks are a key part of what's called the Ormond Beach Task Force, which is a loose coalition of public groups, citizens, you guys could go to this meeting, there's monthly meetings, uh, uh, different state agencies, different nonprofits, etc. And it's not a decision body, it's rather a place where everybody comes together, you know, periodically and updates each other. Hey, this is what's going on with the pesticide, this is what's going on with this restoration plan, that kind of stuff. And it's a great model for engaging the, the community and for everybody being on the same page. So, so this isn't like the meeting you guys just went to, this is not like in the IR thing where they have a, a, a strict agenda on one focused, a single focused topic each time, it's more like let's come together and touch base. That's been really, really key for what's going on. Peter Brand, the gentleman on the right, used to run this for many years from the uh, a Coastal Conservancy, California Coastal Conservancy. Uh, now Chris Kroll has his role, but all kinds of wonderful actors in there. And before we go on and I start talking, I just need to um, say how appreciative that I have I, had an, I have had opportunities to work with many folks that have become heroes of mine. And um, while there are many we could talk about, I'll just flag right now Jean Harris, who's the lady in the, in the blue blouse there. Uh, I first met her the, the first week I can't, um, yeah, for second week I was here when I moved down from Stanford. Didn't know anybody, got this call. Hey, there's this thing going. I went out to a dedication at Ormond Beach. And uh, she was like, who are you? Okay, great, we want to get you involved. It was a really wonderful woman. She um, was a teacher, a school teacher, and she got involved starting in the 60s and 70s with land preservation and rapidly took on Ormond Beach when there was really just her and her friend Roma, just the two of those guys, for years and years. Nobody paid attention. They said, man, this is a really valuable resource, this coastal wetland. We should, this beach and wetland, we should do something about it. And for a long time, they were screaming in the wilderness. And sometimes we can feel like we're screaming in the wilderness with these land use decisions, right? Like, a, we really think we should do X and nobody cares. And they want to turn it into another parking lot and all that kind of stuff. But this is a great example of, of persistence winning, right? And, and being an adult, shall we say, right? as opposed to some of the silliness that goes on in our, our political decisions these days. So um, she was great, and, and when she was getting older, I realized, oh my gosh, she, knows, she has such vast knowledge, probably the greatest reservoir of, of knowledge about the history, the decades of history of people struggling to try to protect this important part of our coast. And um, she was getting, starting to get ill, and I said, I'm gonna go in and start videotaping her. So I, this is in a retirement home next to Ventura College. And so I went in and we recorded the first hour, just her sort of talking about a few things. I'm like, great, that was a great sort of initial start. So next time when I come, let's start doing a more structured interview and we'll talk about this and that. And then unfortunately she passed away um, just after this. And so um, very sad for me, but um, I'm also very privileged that we actually have her archives, the Jean Harris archives are in our library. And so should anybody ever be interested in doing a paper, doing a capstone, anything like that on the sort of human history, maybe Dan could do a cool, cool history on this, but um, we have her recollections and, 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 and papers and all that kind of cool stuff. So, so Jean was a key part and, and several of her colleagues were key reasons why we have anything remaining of our Ormond Beach story. 
since you guys haven't been there yet, I just before we get into the, the more conceptual understanding, I wanted to just throw this up. This is where we stand as of right now. So here we are. And uh, obviously the ocean is, is to the bottom of the picture. And then we have the Oxnard Plain and, and the city of Oxnard as we move in in Port Wainimi. Um, the green is land owned by the Nature Conservancy. I'm not sure if you guys have talked about the Nature Conservancy, but it's a nonprofit. The Nature Conservancy uh, spun off of the Ecological Society of America, which is the professional organization for ecologists in the US, the largest academic group of ecologists. And those folks in, in the 60s were getting a little disappointed and thinking that we weren't, we weren't doing as much as we could. So they sort of formed a splinter group and basically created this nonprofit with, with the main initial goal of simply acquiring land and, and better managing the land. Um, and now they're, uh, as you guys know, they, they own you know, chunks of the Channel Islands, they own chunks of Alaska, all around the world. In this case, they have a very concerted effort to try to recover this part of the coast. And so they've been acquiring land along the Santa Clara River, and they're also very interested in being involved with the Ormond Beach story. So, so they're part of this. So we have nonprofit players in this. Then there's, uh, if you look at the uh, orange color, that's local public land. That's the city of Oxnard owns that chunk of uh, primarily the beach, but a little bit of the lagoon. And then it's surrounded by the light blue. That's uh, state land. So that's land that we've acquired uh, through the State Coastal Conservancy. It's managed by the city of Oxnard, but, but it's, it's state land. And then we have these, as so many uh, times that we do have in these types of situations, it's a cookie cutter, stuff's cut out. So the two things I'll just flag for you to start with is the Ormond Beach Generating Station, that's the power plant. We love to put power plants in wetlands because what the hell else would you do with them, right? So all up and down our coast. So that's a, that's a controversial thing. Um, uh, because have you guys talked about cooling once through cooling and stuff yet or anything? Okay, so sh long story short is um, we have to do less impactful measures with our, our cooling stations. Uh, or excuse me, with our power plants or any other facility on the coast that might need to suck in water to cool down stuff. One, two, we have new emissions requirements in terms of the, the, ch the stuff that comes out of our plants. Um, and so because of that, this particular plant is, its fate is unclear. Secondly, on the left, we'll spend some time talking about, that's the Halico property. That's a former um, industrial site that recycled batteries and things of that nature um, and is now a toxic dump site. So those two things are sort of cookie cuttered out of this, this overall blob that we might want to restore and, and recover the wetlands in. So that's the setting that we have as of today. Has anybody been to Ormond? So most, almost everybody's been to Ormond. Okay, good, great. Any curiosity, with a class or with just on your own? What, what, what classes have you guys gone with? 200? Oh, cons bio? Uh-huh, okay, cool. Okay. Okay, cool. Okay, so, so uh, we might skip through some of this, who cares about wetlands thing since we're tough on, or tight on time. But I'll just talk about a couple different things and then um, hopefully get to our pre-restoration stuff and restoration stuff. Um, the first thing to say about wetlands is they're a challenge from a land use planning standpoint and there's something really easy from a land use standpoint. Firstly, they are, are usually defined as what they're not. So they're not dry land, they're not underwater. And so that's caused some problems historically in terms of agencies, for example, that would fund work in wetlands. The terrestrial folks say, oh, we, we can't fund research into the, that's, like, that's wet. And then the, the sort of aquatic type funders say, oh, that's kind of partly land. And so it's really this not system. It's not dry it's all the time. It's not wet all the time. It's not you know, terrestrial, it's not marine. So it's, it's this twi betwixt between. Um, historically, our society starting from the Western civilization from the Roman days has had this very negative view of wetlands. And so one, since it's we're getting near Halloween, right? Great movie, you guys should go watch this. Um, uh, so this is a black and white movie. This is The Creature from the Black Lagoon, uh, but very emblematic of our historic views of wetlands. So what's this? This is, a, this is a monster. This evil monster comes from the dark, scary wetland. And in this case, there's all kinds of sexist things, all kinds of other stuff going on here too. But, 
but grabs the poor fair maiden that can't possibly defend herself, right? So that's wetland as threat. That's wetland as ominous. That's wetland as danger. This is a more modern take on things. So this is um, the first the first edition of Swamp Thing. So in this, so this became a movie and a TV series, but here, very different. Here, what goes on is that some crazy stuff happens and then this super monster hero thing comes out of the wetland called Swamp Thing and he fights the bad polluters. But now, the hero is coming from the wetland. Now, the good guy is coming from the wetland and the bad guy is the polluter, is the industrial society. So a very different view. Now, we don't all share that view, right? But it's important to say how markedly different that is from the vast history of our society. That now we're starting to think, as you guys just visited the mountain, you guys just were talking about mountain lions, what? A predator is something we want to see more of? What? A wetland that has disease and maybe smells and is hard to drive through and I can't put my house there? That's a good thing? These are very different um, ad uh, attitudes and perceptions. One of the most common ways that we talk about these types of systems these days, especially to folks that don't understand or haven't had a long history with valuing these things, are with things like ecosystem services. And so I typically, if you guys have me in other classes, <laughs> we typically like to talk about functions and values. So functions is the biogeochemical, ecological, the actually the goings on of, of nature. And then the thing on the right, which is the value, that's the worth that we ascribe to that thing. So for example, in the case of wetlands, we could talk about uh, healthy wetlands support stable populations and maybe that leads to lots of birds and maybe we can generate some value from bird watching. Um, really high productivity maybe in these wetlands, not maybe, but truly in these wetlands, very, very high productivity. The only systems that are more productive per unit, per unit area, um, kelp beds sometimes get close, um, but the only other one that really comes close are artificial um, agricultural systems, specifically sugarcane with lots and lots of of nutrient inputs. Sugarcane can produce more biomass per square meter, um, but, but on average, wetlands, in terms of natural ecosystems, wetlands are amazingly productive systems. So one of the values of that is we could produce a bunch of fish that we could eat. We could produce a bunch of critters that we can go hunt and sustain ourselves and do that. Um, all kinds of biogenic structures, uh, such as uh, uh, the stems and, and root masses and stuff like that, and that can lead to things like erosion control to keep our coastlines more stable, for example. And then a lot of our wetlands, uh, coastal wetlands, are at the bottom of these drainages, right? And so we get a lot of silts and a lot of fine substances. And those tend to lead to a lot of um, me metallic organic complexes. And those are really, really fantastic uh, ionic sponges, chemical sponges to absorb stuff. So people talk about wetlands as pollution sponges, and they, they truly are. They, they, they really help clean the water, if you will. So you can pick any one of these and talk to people about, hey, Maybe if you don't get the aesthetic value, the inherent value, whatever, there's all kinds of other practical benefits that we get from wetlands that historically we did not appreciate. And Ormond Beach is but one example of that. Does that make sense? Am I going too fast? I'm, I'm not asking questions because I'm trying to go fast. Okay, the other thing that, to put in context is the loss. A lot of times when we get into these conversations about should we do this land use or that land use or this or that, it's beca it becomes down between we want to do this or that. And, and sometimes people say, well, you're asking too much, right? The, the thing you have to understand with wetlands is we've lost almost all our wetlands here. So let's look at, let's orient to this. So this is the West Coast, this is Washington, Oregon, California. And then I have the amount of wetlands that are now on the, on the far right, and that's relative to about 150 years ago, say the founding of California as a state. And so over that 150 odd, 160, 170 odd, odd year period now, um, we've seen in Washington state, they've lost about one third of their wetlands. Oregon's lost about 40% of their wetlands. We have lost 91% of our wetlands. So when we get in these conversations and we say, hey, maybe we should take some land use action that protects wetlands like Ormond Beach. It's, it's because it's almost all gone, right? So I don't think it's, it's too demanding to say, let's save the last little you know, sliver of these things. California has the greatest proportional loss. Louisiana has the greatest aggregate, just absolute acreage loss. And so we work in both of those settings uh, here in ESRM. 
So if you guys want to come with New Orleans, you should apply our, our applications out now if you guys want to come with us. Dan's coming with me to New Orleans this year. You guys can come and we can talk about all kinds of crazy. You think we have crazy land use? You, have, you know nothing yet. Um, so anyways, and then, and then this is uh, Ventura County. We're a, bit, we're a bit better than the statewide average. And, and in this case, this is just our coastal fringe. We've lost about 60% of our wetlands. Um, okay, so that's in context. So, so key number, California, 91% of our wetlands are gone. Those 9% that remaining aren't kick butt, aren't super healthy. This is just absolute extent. So much of that 9% is degraded in one form or another. So we have very little pristine wetland remaining. Okay, uh, a little bit of historical context. Again, you guys ask me questions, I'm going fairly fast here. But uh, let's, see, let's talk a little bit about historical overview. I'll, I'll talk about a couple examples and then we'll get into Ormond Beach. So uh, we have, there's, we've been interacting with our wetlands for a long time. This is a, um, these are some illustrations of some villages up in the San Francisco Bay area with the Ohlone and those guys that were living in San Francisco Bay for at least 4,000 years. And that image on the right I like a lot. In this case, they're making reed boats, but that's a, that's a nice representation on the right. Sometimes we think that all the impacts started in World War II or whatever. Um, humans are, were having a significant impact, in this case, clearing a lot of vegetation for shelters and, and, and the like. And this is my, my favorite, my classic example I talk about. So this is Elkhorn Slough. So I, I, I'm on many scientific advisory panels. I used to be on this one back when I was up in Northern California. But this painting up on the left is really neat. So this is, this is from uh, back in the day. We don't typically have cool views of these systems, right? But in this case, this is in a church in, um, what's the, Ca Castroville. Castroville, is it Castroville? Watsonville. Watsonville, is it Watsonville? Yes, something like that, one of those places. Uh, there's this cool old church, and what was happening is there's this, there this itinerant European painter that was coming through, and he didn't have any money. He's like, dude, can I stay here for a while? And they said, well, I don't know, can you do anything? He said, well, I could paint. And they go, okay, maybe paint, maybe it's a painting. So he spent many weeks painting this image up there. So that's, a, that's a, a fairly, we believe, accurate representation of what the Elkhorn Slough was like, coastal wetland in Monterey Bay, um, in 1890. And so if we look at that, what we see already by 1890, we have, we have, where are we? Um, so a coastal lagoon. So, so here's the ocean. Here's some beach, some, some type of uh, terrestrial land. And then we have this river coming in here, freshwater source. And then we have this lagoon system. Already people are crossing the lagoon. Already people are built up to the edges. Already people are doing agri intensive agriculture in the plain. Um, here's a picture of that bridge. The guy's going across to, to get from one side to the other. Um, and then very rapidly after this painting is, is made, oh sorry, and then right here, uh, in this case, these guys are using a barge, so not, not a bridge, but, but floating, uh, moving crops and getting across themselves with this uh, short uh, pole type of uh, transportation. Very quickly, uh, we have this. We start to do stuff like drain and dike the, the wetlands because, again, we hate wetlands. Wetlands suck, right? We're, they're, they're, the term is um, reclamation, right, as if as if they were bad, but we can come in and drain them, get the water away, and then, they're, then they have value, then they're useful. So in this case, we do this all, all over the coast. We uh, start to drain land and make it pasture land so we can grow cows, because you can't grow cows anywhere else. Might as well put them right there in the estuary. Uh, and then we start doing things like, like in the middle picture here in the 1950s, uh, power plant put a power plant in there, got a lot of water, need water to help cool the plant, so let's do that. So we have our power plants are sprinkled up and down our coastal wetlands here. And then by 2005, we have significant erosion issues and, and we're, we're losing um, some, of our, some of our banks are disappearing at a me the, the creeks are widening a meter a year. So lots of erosion going on. So this notion, and this is usually where you and I come into the picture in 2005, right? Okay, cool. So, so, so it's, it usually, that's where we come into play. And we don't always have this history, but with many of our land use decisions, this history is really, really helpful, right? It can tell us that these assaults have been going on for a long time. It can tell us what's a sustainable practice. This, is, this has been working for a long time um, and, and so forth. Make sense? Okay, so let's look at our story here. So this is Magoo Ormond. 
So this is the oldest map I have. This is 1737. That's a Spanish land grant map, and it's not really it's not really a great map, right? It's more of a cartoony map. But look, what you can see already is you can it might be hard to tell, but in, the, in that picture on the right hand side is the ocean. We're basically floating over Ventura, looking towards the Santa Monica Mountains. So we see the Santa Monica Mountains in the background. And then we see, hard to, hard to see, but this guy right, where is he? Right here, this is Laguna, right? What does that mean? Lagoon. So if you drive off, if you go from Potrero here, leaving campus, drive across, you hit Lewis. If you drive straight across, what's that road called? What's it? Laguna, right? That road was named because the lagoon went all the way up to here, all the way up to campus back when they were naming roads, right? So it's really easy if you don't have this historical background to start to think of these things as being constrained or small or in one place, when in reality these wetlands were, were quite expansive. So we'll run through some of these examples real quick. Um, I got about 10 minutes, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how fast we can go. But all these things are going on, have gone on in our, in our wetlands. Um, this is what it looks like now. I, I used to, I did a bunch of restoration stuff there when I was younger. And this is at the top of Magoo Peak looking towards uh, Ormond and, and the area out there. This is what, this is 1997. This picture on the right is 1947. So 1947, the opposite direction, looking the opposite way, it's relatively intact. We have a lot of salt, we have a lot of vegetation. Um, the beaches look pretty good. And um, I like this quote. So this is the, from that, that interview with Jean Harris. So Roy Lockwood, so this, she's talking about a guy that she knew. She says, Roy Lockwood, who passed away a long time before we started talking about it. Roy Lockwood has been deceased now for a long, long time. But when I met him in the 1970s, he would tell me about all the fishing camps that he used to have out there. How when he was a young boy in the 1920s, 1910s, uh, at high tide, he could pat, pull his boat. So not, not paddling, but just sticking the ground and pulling. He could pull his boat from Magoo Rock all the way to Port Wainimi. Can you imagine how wonderful? So these, these wetland complexes were significant. They weren't a little pocket here, a little pocket there, a little pocket here. They weren't cut up the way we have them cut up now. They really were this, this contiguous ecosystem. OK, uh, so you guys have read the Santa Clara History Report? No, OK. So, Real briefly, now we're looking down at the county now, straight down. This is from a historical ecological study from a few years ago. And you see Mogul Lagoon at the bottom right. And then you see uh, Ventura is up at the top of the map, the city of Ventura. And what you're seeing there is the historic channels of the Santa Clara River. So the Santa Clara River used to end at Magoo. And then it sometimes ended at Ormond. And it sometimes ended where it is now. So it, it has gone back and forth across the Oxnard Plain. So the Oxnard Plain is one of the 10 best agricultural deltas in the world to grow stuff because this river was going up and back and forth, dumping all this wonderful uh, soil and, you know, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So we lose track of that when we now fix these hydrological structures in place with, with cemented things and dams and stuff, but realize it did move all around. Um, and this is what Magoo looks like uh, just at the start of World War II. That's when we first start to have a significant presence you see right there on the sand spit. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of jump through these slides super quick so we have more time to talk about other things. But suffice it to say, um, we really start getting in, we really start transforming Magoo in World War II. We first go there because um, we're fighting the war in the Pacific and we don't have airplanes that can fly very far. So the airplanes have to do what they call island hop. So the Jap forces of the Japanese Empire start taking over the Pacific and everybody's freaked out and then we start fighting back and so uh, the US and the Allied forces start driving back but the plan is not to drive to Japan, the plan is to take this island and set up a base and get all, everybody breathe for a while then go to the next island so we have to island hop. So that means we have to move our planes there and so what, one of the first uses of Magoo in an industrial way is as a training center for World War II. So this is a place where they bring, brought 17 year olds, 18 year old kids Put them up, took, put them on the sandy beaches, which they use as, a, as an analogy for the South Pacific beaches, and they taught them how to build um, air airstrips, landing strips on the sandy beach. So they'd spend a week or two, show them how to build it. When they finished, they'd rip them up, they'd put them on boats, ship them out. The next week, in, come a new, in would come new recruits. These, they'd teach these engineers, these so-called construction battalions, what we call CBs. 
They would teach, and so over and over again. And so World War II was a very valuable resource. And at the end of World War II, people said, wow, maybe we should keep this. This maybe should be useful. That's why we have the, the military base that we, do, that we do. But this is the start of it. Still, our presence is on the beach, right? But look at all the back. The back is, we still have relatively uh, expansive coastal wetlands. Again, we're looking towards Magoo Rock at this point. PCH is right along the, the toe of the mountain there. Um, I should just say, without going too fast, that this was a large Chumash center for a long, long time. So lots of uh, historic places. As you guys probably know, campus is an important Chumash center. So Round Mountain is an important um, cultural spot for the Chumash. Um, we get the name Magu from Cabrillo. He originally writes it M-A-G-U, and so there's been spelling challenges ever since. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay, there's that map I showed you guys. Uh, this is what we think one guess, best guess, it's what the ecosystem was like in the early 1800s before we started actively really doing a lot of agriculture, et cetera. And so what you see is what you would expect to see. We have these tidal, we have the, these channels coming in. Again, Orman, the Oxnard Plain, excuse me, is very flat. So even just a little teeny bit of depression is, is, uh, and it can form important hydrological channels. And so we see that. That's what the, that's what the blue uh, dash stuff is highlighting. And we see a mix of, of uh, tidal salt marsh and then more, more terrestrial vegetation inland. And then this is overlaying that black outline is our current land holdings. You guys get a sense of where we're talking about. We have some wonderful resources uh, here. Uh, it, the, one of the most important ones are the so-called T-sheets. These historic, And these are all online. If you guys are interested, you can download them all straight into GIS. You can download them into Google Earth. You can just look at them. They're really, really cool. These were from the U.S. Coastal Survey. Um, so important was coastal navigation to our country that we paid people to go around the country and do highly, highly accurate maps of the coastline. So most of these folks were, were cared about the harbors and the, and the coastlines, if there were any navigational hazards. But a lot of times what they would do is they would just note what else was inland, especially if we had a place like Magoo Peak where the, the people generating the map could go up and get a more of an aerial view, and that's what we had here. So we get this indication, as I already mentioned, but we get this indication how far inland these coastal wetlands extended. It's a really cool resource, these, these, um, these maps. Uh, we start a uh, short version with agriculture. We start initially with grazing livestock and some very uh, chill farming. The initial phase of farming is really centered around legumes. Legumes fix their own nitrogen, so we don't need to add fertilizer. And this, this is so-called dry farming. So you put the beans, you put the seeds in the ground, and you water them a little bit, and then pretty much you don't do anything. We're able to do that because of June gloom that's here. Let me do it on time. Sorry, I'm going, going slow. Uh, so June gloom keeps the, the, hot, you know, the hot part of the summer down, so it doesn't stress the plants out. So that really helps. That allows folks to do this so-called dry farming. That lasts for a long time. And then there's a great new book out on the history of of Oxnard, the city of Oxnard and, and sugar beets. Then basically some folks figure out how to make sugar from things other than sugar cane, from sugar beets. And so uh, people get the idea that we could do that here. That leads to the founding of the city of Oxnard, etc. And that phases out this dry era of farming. Now we start doing things like, um, like sugar beets and then pretty rapidly after that things like strawberries and other things that need a lot of water. So then we have to mess with the whole hydrology of the Oxnard Plain because we need to bring water here. But now it's so flat, the water doesn't drain. So then we have to build drains. And so that starts this whole alteration of the hydrology of the Oxnard Plain. And uh, so this is a good shot. So right here, we're looking from basically Magoo Peak, uh, now this way towards, towards Oxnard. And you can see already, this is in the 1930s. Already, look at all those. Everything's cut up in crops, right? Everything is all patchwork quilt of, of crops. So agriculture is one theme. Another theme is access. So more and more access we see coming through. Um, PCH opens up, and that allows folks from LA to come up more easily, et cetera. Um, uh, we mentioned the military bases, 1941. These guys on the beach doing stuff. Um, hydrology already mentioned. Uh, more and more channelization, all that kind of stuff that comes along with, with moving, bringing water to the crops and taking water away from the crops. I'll just note uh, here, this last bullet point right here, 
when we, when we, after World War II, when we start the real formal military base, we dredge the central basin, the, the, the main part where the river is, enough to fill the entire rest of the base with anywhere from one to four meters of sediment. So we took a massive amount of sediment out of the marsh to make the, much of the base terrestrial, right? To, to make it higher than the intertidal zone. So we could have landing strips and, and bases and all that kind of stuff. But this remains an incredibly dynamic system. We have very erodible soils here. So this is from a cover of an ecological study from uh, the late 70s. And this is really amazing. So this is looking straight down in the central basin. So to orient you, the ocean is on the bottom. So the ocean, like where it says 1971, that's the ocean. And then if we go straight into, and or to the right, you're going to hit PCH. So that's Cayugas Creek. This is basically the mouth of Cayugas Creek that we're looking at. And so a little hard to see maybe, uh, depending on where you are in the room, but the dark center, that is standing water. You guys with me? On the left, that's standing water. And then the stuff that's light, and, and, and grayish color is either sand or vegetation or, or other terrestrial stuff. 1977, it looks pretty much the same, pretty much the same. And then we have this huge storm. One three-day storm fills in about a third of the lagoon in one storm. So we started to look at 1978, and we went from, at high tide, two parts standing water to one part mud flat slash marsh to the opposite. It became two thirds mud flat slash marsh. Massive amounts of sediment coming through this river. And then you see the next slide over, you start, that's starting to sediment in. So we dug out, we excavated a bunch of this wetland and now much of it has been filled in at this point. Um, this was uh, one of my classes a couple years ago. We were mapping the hydrology with some colleagues from, um, from Monterey Bay. And so we're looking at the, the, the topography underneath there and it's pretty cool. The, other, the last theme I think I'll talk to you guys about before we show examples of the restoration is this theme of recreation. So we have this theme of, of changing hydrology, changing access, changing agriculture, and then lastly, changing um, entertainment, how you and I engage with these coastal resources. So we have uh, Ventura County Game Preserve and Point, what was legally called Point Magu Game Reserve. Those are duck hunting clubs that still exist they're inland and to the north of Magoo. They're, one of them is owned by six people. One is owned by a few more. They're all billionaires. They don't care. They just they want to come out once a year and shoot ducks. So it's very unclear where we ha can purchase that land from those folks. They're very politically powerful, very wealthy, and they like to have their duck club. So they, <laughs> they start then. Importantly, though, we have all kinds of other cool stuff like the fish camp that's incorporated in 23, and the movie industry, which goes crazy in the 20s and 40s. So here's some examples of that. So all kinds of movies are filmed at Magoo. They use it as a backdrop for the South Pacific. They'll bring in some palm trees, plant some palm trees, and they film all these silent pictures and all kinds of other things at Magoo, heavily, heavily utilized. Um, and so you see what one example of the density of, of uh, the, movie, the movie industry there. Then on the right, this is one of my famous pictures I like so much. This is, we we'll talk about this in coastal in, uh, shortly. But that's um, what we now call a giant sea bass. We used to call it a black sea bass. Um, this is with the t was the top car carnivore in our coastal ecosystems. This is, a, this is a massive fish. This was caught by this lady in her hoop skirt. And, the, and the, on the back of the photograph from the historical Ventura uh, Historical Society, when I found it, it said, a typical Saturday catch at Magoo Fish Pier. So if you look up, and the guys in the movie industry, you look, look up in the upper picture, you see a pier. There used to be a pier at Magoo, a fishing pier. And it would be packed with people. People would come in, come to this fish camp, just come for the day. Fish, 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 fish. Massive fish productivity. That fish on the right is now an endangered species. We've really altered these ecosystems, not just in the terrestrial world, but the marine world. So again, when we talk about land use decisions, when we talk about recovering stuff, I think we typically look at space, and that's an important thing. But it's also important to think of function, right? What, what functions do these ecosystems provide, and can our decisions help recover some of that stuff? I think that fish was like 350 pounds or something, that particular one. Um, really cool stuff. OK, jumping forward. Uh, we've, we've had all kinds of pressure to develop Orman. There's been, for decades, there's been ideas to to do kinds of stuff. So here's, a, here's a one, just one quick example of that. This is from, um, so this is, again, so Magoo would be to the right in this picture, right? So the ocean is to the bottom. 
and then Orman and Wainimi, all the urban areas to the left. So here's a plan to put in a, uh, a sort of recreational wetland kind of thing, including, they always include this, a pool. If you only put a pool on the beach, I never, I never got that. Like, really? Like, why would you just go into the water? But uh, don't get me started on Broad Beach or anything. But so so um, anyway, so this is a hotel complex that we're going to put on. Because what else will we do? Let's put another hotel in there. Um, again, the power plant we already touched on, but the power plant is there. And um, I should note that this is, um, these are peaker plants. So these don't function 24 hours a day, every day of the year. These serve, and it's the similar plant up closer to the city of Ventura, these serve as emergency power, typically emergency power. The last couple of years, since we've lost our nuclear plant in uh, Orange County, uh, they've been going more. But, but typically the idea is only when we get into sort of summer brownout periods or whatever, then they'll function. So that means these are dirty plants. These are dirtier than the, the typical um, all the time running power plants. Initially, this plant is a fuel oil plant and then an oil plant, and then now it's a natural gas-fired uh, turbine plant. And this used to be a utility. This used to be Southern California Edison. And then with the wave of deregulation a few decades ago, it's actually now owned by a private company. So uh, that's the story there. Um, again, all kinds of plans for development. Um, all kinds of sensitive species are here. So we can talk about tidewater gobies, plants like salt marsh bird's beak, Spiny rush, uh, and then of course the charismatic birds that everybody talks about, terns and snowy plovers, least terns and snowy plovers. Um, so these guys all have implications for our land use decisions, right? The, the, these guys are either impacted by the Federal Endangered Species Act, State Endangered Species Act, or they're on a state rare plant list, something to that effect. So that, that influences um, some of the land use decisions. Um, here's one example from a, several years ago now, but this is uh, nesting density. So these birds love to be on the sandy beach, where we like to be on the sandy beach. So they cause all kinds of challenges. But um, you guys see any pattern as to the dots? So the dots are different species. Any pattern you see with the dots here from 2008? Yeah. Turns out when you have a power plant with lights on all day long, that's not good for birds. So we've, we've since done some experiments where we've turned off the lights for certain periods of time. And surprise, surprise, you get more bird activity. So it's very clear the birds aren't in the middle, of, middle right side of this graph because of that power plant. There's also a huge challenge that we have in all, a lot of our coastal land use issues with homeless folks. And this is only getting worse. Only getting worse with our economy and various things. But we had a huge problem for several years. That, that's, Chris, that's one of, your, uh, one of your fellow students a few years ago who graduated and now uh, has gone on to better, bigger and better things. Um, but uh, one of the things he did was he founded VC Shorebirds, a, a nonprofit. His capstone was working out there. But one of the biggest problems we had was this. This is a homeless encampment on the beach in the middle of the endangered species area, right near where we want to do restoration. And there were many, many of these structures. So the challenge with this is, you, you might think, oh, it's a driftwood structure, we should knock it down, right? So one, that means people are walking back and forth, maybe stepping on chicks and stuff like that. Two, you're, somebody's eating there, maybe dropping food, attracting predators and stuff like that. And then also probably just attracting corvids, crows and things like that. So none, none, none of that is good for the birds. So you might think, oh, let's go and knock that shelter down. If you were to do that, the homeless folks back in the day would have rebuilt it right back up within a day. Also, you're not allowed to knock that down. You have to go out and put a notice with the sheriff. You have to staple a notice onto that piece of wood because it, it's considered somebody's home that says, we're going to evict you in three days and then come out later. And so it's, it's just a very logistically challenging thing. So we, we've, we've had a wonderful thing, which is Walter. And you guys will hopefully meet Walter when you go out there. Um, uh, Somebody that's living out there for us, our, our sentry, our, our watchdog, uh, loves to interpret for people and stuff. But he has had a great rapport with our homeless community. And he's, through a long-term, you know, lots of years of working, have encouraged our homeless folks to not be on the beach anymore. So they've actually moved inland a bit, not solving the problem, but at least they're not in this main prime bird nesting area. So what that says is, is there's huge problems with homeless folks in all of our coastal wetlands, but they, it is a tractable problem. It might take some time, it might take a while, but we can, we can deal with that. Um, yeah, so there's a chick, you guys all see the chick, right? Super easy to see, 
no problem. Everybody sees it like no problem. Um, all kinds of other silliness was happening. So I'll talk about a couple of examples, and then if, if you need to kick me off, you can kick me off. So, okay, so, um, so we talk about some things in ESRM, right? And we look back like, how could that person possibly do that, right? Many times, not all, but many times people didn't know, didn't understand the negative consequences of some particular action, right? So it's really easy to have hindsight and say, those guys are bastards, those guys shouldn't have done that, right? But there actually are times when people were bastards, when people knew exactly what they were doing, knew exactly the, the downside, the negative consequences, and they went ahead anyway. And that's the story of Halico, the, 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 the Superfund site. So this right here is from a state Supreme Court uh, uh, ruling, finding, and I forget the year, 1970 something. And so it's talking about this, and it's basically saying, these guys are doing bad stuff. These guys are leaking toxins into the nearby environment and the nearby wetlands, and that's bad. So you should stop that. Okay, they weren't, they weren't ignorant of this. This is decades and decades ago. The company basically said, screw you. And they continued to do what they were doing. So we're looking now at, this is a shot from 2002 when Halico was still active. And so we're looking, so the ocean is obviously to the, to the back here. And uh, this big gray mass right there is tailings, is, is the remnants of this recycling. So this was a recycling. Thing. You're like, awesome, I like recycling. We're ESRM, we like recycling. They took all kinds of stuff other people wouldn't take. They would take nuclear reactors. They would take all kinds of weird machine parts and all kinds of stuff. So recycling, good thing. But they would take that stuff and then, and so the, the center of the picture is the main processing area. And then, and have a look. This is the natural drainage of this part of the Oxnard plant. It just had me right there, right? Perfect, well, super fantastic. And so they would, they would generate, so they would melt stuff down, smelt it down, get the metals they can use, right, and, and, and recycle the vast majority of stuff. But there's some gunk. You're always left over with some gunk. And that gunk is what that gray pile is. They just started throwing this stuff out. This was controlled by a family. The family knew exactly what they were doing. The family had recycling facilities around the country. They began to divest themselves of the company. They created through legal means, they created a shell company and they, create, they, they, they isolated themselves. So I believe they're still operating a plant in Tennessee. So these folks basically said, oh, bankrupt, have to go, bye, sorry, doo -doo, and they left. So they, they, left, they left this for you. They left this for you to clean up. So this is now an EPA super fun site, which means massively toxic and there's no mechanism to clean, to, there's no, no, no owner or whoever we can go get to clean. So why is this here? Uh, we should do a question and answer thing, but again, I'm trying to finish up quickly. So this is in Ormond. This is a stinky wetland. Who cares about this place, right? It's skanky. So let's do it there. Who's living around us? Who's living around us are um, a lot of high density housing, a lot of our migrant farm worker communities, folks that may not, be, uh, may not have uh, citizenship status or other things. They're not gonna complain. Right? So you have disenfranchised populations, a lot of folks speaking Spanish, a lot of folks that are, have reason to be um, maybe not running to the cops all the time and reporting violations. Right? So this is a perfect recipe for someone that wants to abuse the existing laws and land use zoning and that kind of stuff, and they did. There's also, my friends have told me that, in the, so there's the, there's the pile of stuff right along the wetland, and it's blowing, right? Wind comes in, it blows. It rains, stuff dribbles off, it, 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 it's in the water. So, um, so some folks that I know went out to try to get some samples in the 80s, 70, late 80s, 70s, early 80s, and they, had, they put security guards on the top of the pile with high-powered rifles and shot at them. So presumably they weren't shooting at them, they were shooting over their heads, but that's the caliber of people we're talking about that operated this Halico site. They were not doing something they thought was great and then oh by the way I accidentally had an impact they knew exactly what they were doing and they didn't care and they've left that legacy for you so we're trying to figure out what to do the company declares bankruptcy they disappear this is this is this is at ormond this is at the tnc property and we're looking towards that pile now that thing that looks like a big island up there that's all sludge 
And so brilliant idea. Peter Brand from the, from the Coast Commission figures out the EPA has a strike team. Who knew? Who knew? The EPA has strike teams all around the country for when the power plant blows up, when the chemical plant explodes. So we have on retainer all these specialized hazardous material people that live and are trained to just respond to stuff. So that d should the chemical plant explode, you get there really quickly, unless you're in Houston, that's another story. But so, so the idea here is everybody's on retainer. They're all trained. So we found out that they mostly sit around. They don't, they don't really do anything, right? And so we called them up and said, hey, we have this site that's maybe got a lot of heavy metals and things in it, but we don't have anything to do. You know, we don't have any resources to deal with this. And they're like, oh my God. So they came out originally for a couple days to assess it. They end up staying for six months. So we use this emergency response team that's normally used, again, for crisis situations. And they're like, oh my God, we're this, we consider this a crisis. So they went and they did all this wonderful work for us in 2006. So they stabilized this. They put jute netting. They, they essentially covered this so it wouldn't blow in the wind too much. They took the slopes down a little so it wouldn't erode as much. And they did some of the initial uh, rigorous testing around the site that is what has allowed us to figure out exposures and stuff to this day. So that was a temporary thing, but really, really helpful. Um, the last thing I'll show before we show you some quick restoration plans, um, this is the hydrology. So um, going from relatively high is the, is the yellowish to as we get to the, the cooler colors, we're getting lower and lower elevations. And what you see is um, a lot of the land ain't super high. Right? It wants to be a wetland. It wants to be a wetland. Even though we've done things like put up dikes and, and change it, it, it really is at about the right elevation to be a wetland. So it's relatively easy to restore this site compared to some other systems. Uh, the thing down there on the far right is the, is the duck pond. OK, skip, skip, skip this. I already showed you guys this. Um, skip all this reference condition stuff. Um, one of the ways, so, so we're going to restore it. How might we restore it? I'm going to ask you a question, you give me answers, but then we're going fast, so I'm not listening to your answers. So, okay, here we go. So here's one way, is we take an old photograph, this is an old photograph, and we take some of those maps from the 1850s, and, or like a modern thing, and you just throw the map on there, right? So the first thing you could do is to say, hey, historically the wetlands went to this point, maybe we should make those wetlands go to that point again, right? So that's one type of an approach. Uh, any, any downsides with that? Anybody, can anybody see any downsides of taking the historic distribution of a community and overlaying it right now? Right, there's already, there's already stuff there, right? So, that, so there's, there's the barrier of you having to buy the land and acquire the land and all this and that. Any other, any other issues with that? Stuff might, be, stuff might have changed, right? So maybe we needed a bird to fertilize this or a, or a vegetation was growing there that's now extinct or something. So, so the ecosystem has shifted now as well. So both we have this issue of, of what is the cor correct historic endpoint back in the day, if we could somehow go back in time. And then it's the question of, can we do that now? So one of the things we use is this notion of reference, of, of some kind of reference site. And that's this. Again, we'll, we'll jump through this really quick. But just to give you guys the conceptual idea, the idea is this. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to have some measures. It might be aerial extent of the wetlands, like I just showed you. But it could be other things as well. It could be, could be birds laying eggs. It could, be, it could be the amount of fish that have babies. It could be whatever you, you want to think of, that, that aspect of the environment. And what we'd like to do is this is this, is this uh, generic measure of age from, from now to on the future on the x-axis, and then some measure of ecological functioning. Sometimes people put biodiversity on that axis. Generally speaking, we want to be able to distinguish the pink line, which is bad restoration, poor ecological functioning, bad ecosystem, from the green line. Everything's good, right? There's always variation in nature, but basically we like, presumably those things are different. What we want to do in restoration is make the orange line. We want to go from a condition of poor functioning, low functioning, and over time, recover that function. That's the ideal goal. And we'll skip all this stuff. Um, suffice it to say that, suffice it to say that uh, we, can, we use different metrics. If you guys are interested in doing this, a great capstone project. So we use things like seeds. 
We use things like insect productivity um, as measures of, the, of our condition. So we measure insect productivity with these little, little sticky traps that we stick out in the wetland. And you find things like this. Um, in this case, this is, this is, these are seeds in the seed bank. And the, let's see, I moved the slide in a while. So the, um, the orange are restorations that we did. The green are natural marshes. And you see different variation. So that won't make, make much sense to you right now, but I'll show you a different slide. So here's an example of a trap up at Stanford, up at the dish, with full of, full of bugs. Um, and uh, we'll skip all this. Uh, put that on pause for one second. Um, we're increasingly look, using rapid assessments to figure out how our wetlands are performing. There's one that we use for wetlands called CRAM, California Rapid Assessment Methodology. We're essentially trying to develop the same thing for sandy beaches, those of you that have helped us out on, on the beach stuff. But um, essentially that's going to a site for a couple hours and looking at it and figuring out its condition and, and, and being able to compare that with other sites. Um, and so what you can do is you can take some of these conditions. I'm, I'm going too fast, I think. This is the result from CRAM, which looks totally crazy. This, these are different sites on the x-axis. These are different wetland sites. And these are different uh, ways of constructing the indicator. You can take all that, and you can actually convert those into, even though we don't have, like I said before, only 9% of our wetlands remaining are healthy. So we don't have 9% 9, 9 of awesome model wetlands. To go, hey, Ormond Beach should look just like this, right? We have some that have kick butt butterflies. We have some that have kick butt fish. We have some that have kick butt plants, but we don't always have all these things together. So you could use approaches like this to design the restoration and then to guide your performance. So for example, we, in this case, this is the CRAM score. So we went out, assessed all these wetlands, came together. This looks at hydrology, this looks at invasive plants, all these various things, stressors and conditions and stuff. And so what tends to happen is these systems tend to clump together. So we have this, this clumping on the, on the left here, and you can use that as a measure of bad stuff, bad condition, poor performance. Up on the far right, that would be maybe your target. Hey, this might be the best we can function. Notice those, those best we can function, they're not 100% perfect. They're not getting 100% on that score, but they're getting relatively high. When we do these land use decisions, when we do wetland planning and that kind of stuff, it's really important to not say we want the 100% goal <laughs> because it's almost impossible to get that. And you will destroy yourself. You'll spend a gazillion billion dollars. You'll, you'll consume all your time and effort trying to get to a condition that might not be attainable in the real, in the real world. But this is telling us the stuff that's really, really close, say 90% of that functioning, that actually is possible. So you can use these, these natural states to guide us, the, the remnant states to guide us. And so either you can distinguish bad from good, or you can distinguish on the left, maybe that would be year one. And then the middle scores, maybe that's year three, four, five. And then on the right, maybe that's years seven, eight, nine, ten, kind of thing. So, so we can use these different things to help us uh, plan. So I'll finish up right now, just show you guys some examples. Again, this is where we are in terms of the, the, the site. Um, <laughs> All kinds of craziness has been going on. That's the coast. That's the beach, where the beach has been the la over the last couple decades. So uh, the orange line is 1929. The pink line is 1945. The yellow is 1964. So what's the trend? Yeah, the beach is going inland, right? So, um, so one, we're, we're losing. So, so the, the, the shape of the coast is changing which is one thing. All of the existing land use constraints are another key thing. So we mentioned the Halico Superfund site. I should have said, the estimates are just to dig the stuff up, not to restore, just to dig that stuff. It's probably about 60 million, 60, 70 million. So we don't necessarily have 60 or 70 million dollars lying around, so hence we have the pile still. Um, but there's all kinds of other constraints. So the most important one, in probably in terms of your guys' class, is all that green stuff. That green stuff is privately held land. So some of the owners are, are some folks that I know. They're, they're, they're good nuts. Um, they purchase this land, and they want, they want some money for it. And so 
in the, before the economic collapse in 2006, we were in negotiations to buy the land from those guys. So they, they, were, in, they were interested in selling if they made a certain profit on their land. So they wanted uh, a lot of money per acre, dollar per acre, which was totally excessive. And so we said, no, we don't have that much money. So they said, okay, screw it, then I'm not gonna sell it to you. So they turned around and tried to change the land use condition. So it's, zone, it's right now zoned for ag. They tried to get it zoned, change the zoning to light industry. So what's light industry? You guys know what light industry is? So light industry would be, um, uh, have you guys been to Institution Ale? That's light industry. So, so sort of, you know, small area where we have like some, maybe there's some shops, some auto shops, maybe it's a printer. So not, not heavy industry, not big type stuff, but but sort of strip molly kind of stuff, that's light industry. That's more, that is considered more valuable on a square footage basis than uh, ag land. So the approach that these guys took was to try to get their land rezoned and so they could then, then, then they could make more money. These guys aren't stupid. They understand that this is all gone with, within the next couple decades, right? At least, at least in terms of farming with saltwater intrusion, sea level rise, all this and that. So I think they might have screwed the pooch. They could have made a, a decent, uh, they could have made a modest profit, but they didn't. And so now we don't have any money, right? Now we're broke. So now we don't have as much money to buy from them. We'll eventually, the wetland will eventually win. Eventually the, all, the, all that green stuff is, or much of that green stuff will become wetland. It's just a matter of if we do it with a great planning process or if it's gonna happen catastrophically with floods and stuff. So we have, we have the changing coast, we have sea level rise, and we have these constraints that, that are around us. So one of the big issues is not just working at Magoo, but working at the surrounding land, with the surrounding landholders, so we're doing compatible things. You guys went to the mountain lion hearing, right? So it's both the, the crossing, but it's also, what's the area to the right, to the entrance and exit of the crossing, right? If that's totally armored, if that's all strip mall, the, the critters can't get there. So it's both your core area and your, your surrounding area. Sorry, I'm going too long. Um, so I'll just show you guys a couple quick examples and then, we'll, and then I'll shut up. But uh, this, this, is, this is some work, this is, one of, this is a capstone project from one of your predecessors looking at some of the vegetation in these areas. Um, Mm, 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 mm. Okay, here we go. So originally the plans we designed, we just, everything had two versions. They had, if we could eliminate the constraints and if the constraints are in place. The two main constraints, again, being the power plant in the middle and the toxic dump site on the side. So you could do things like this. Here's one option. This is a deep water lagoon. So this is great for fish. This is the one, it, it, left unchecked, this is the gravity well that all the plans will tend towards. Why? Because the port of LA Long Beach is a major environmental impactor, causing all kinds of damage. So they primarily cause damage in deep water environments, in a harbor, in a port, in a lagoon type of setting. And they're crazy rich, right? There, there are all kinds of capitals going through there. So they would love to find areas in Southern California where they can help, because they've done this with Bolsa Chica, all over, they, they can want to give a lot of money, give you millions of dollars to restore this area, but the trick is you have to make mitigation for them. You have to make habitat that would help fish, right? So it's kind of the siren songs, like here's some money, but you gotta do it this way. This really wasn't what this ecosystem used to be. But nevertheless, you could do something like that, where it's mostly deep, open water, deep water habitat, Here's, here's, the, here's the image if we got rid of the constraints. Here's the image if we kept those constraints in place, right? Uh, we could do something different. We could do something that didn't have as much uh, open water, still had that lagoonal type system on the upper part, but maybe had a bit more, the thing on the right, a bit more <clears throat> spring fed, sort of sub, subsurface water fed, more of like a marshy situation, um, more towards sort of coastal prairie. Or we could do that with the, um, with the constraints. We could just say, let's not worry too much about the wetland. Let's just make more of a coastal strand type of community, right? Where we're sort of de-emphasizing the wetlands, but favoring more of the terrestrial edge type of vegetation. You do something like that. Or, or, or without the constraints. Oh yeah, sorry, that's the end.
Um, so right where we are right now is our scientific advisor team is, is working on the next iteration of the plans. And we've pretty much decided that we're done. We're, we're, we're done doinking around like this. So we've given up on the, these types of plans and we're now going to these plans. We see no um, likely scenario in the next 10, 15 years when we're gonna have the Halico plant gone and the power plant. Even if the power plant shuts down, there's gonna be years of, of disassembly and all this and that. So we've decided we're not gonna wait. We're gonna start with our restoration plans with these constraints in place. Um, and so that's where we're going, that's where we're going for now. So we have an advisory team, scientific advisory team, but also there's all kinds of ways you guys can be involved. Great capstone projects, all kinds of really cool capstone projects. One of the most interesting things that I'll end with is, is what to do up here. So up here, there's been huge interest in a gate, so-called gateway park. The gateway park would be a point of entry. So you and I might think of the value of restoring this area as more ecosystem, as more benefit for the plants and animals. Most of our community sees this as a place for them to interact with nature. For folks that don't have a lot of money, folks that don't have a lot of cars and things like that might, might not be able to get to Yosemite. So they wanna have places where their community can come recreate. And so the nation of the Gateway Park is it's close to the human settlement, right? And, um, and it's a, it's a way, place to interpret this. Let me tell you why these wetlands are so cool, that type of stuff. So maybe it would involve boardwalks, maybe it wouldn't. But also that would be a place where some of the city thinks they could turn more into an ecotourism destination, right? So a place to, to turn into maybe a revenue generator, not just something that's gonna consume uh, resources, but something that either be maybe revenue neutral, or maybe even be a little revenue positive. So the notion of identifying their community with this, the notion of equal access for everybody, and the notion of having it face the community as opposed to not as somewhere else, you know, over towards the military base, et cetera. Cool? So that was really, really super fast. Sorry, I, I probably skipped some important things, but, but uh, is, is there anything else you want me to talk about that I didn't touch on? No, it's a really quick, the Science Advisory Committee is to the Army um, the so the structure is a it, kind of so the structure is um, we're let's see Coastal Conservancy is paying the bills TNC is operationally sort of orchestrating it and then we have a we have a consultant ESA that's doing some of the initial plans um, so I should know <laughs> Uh, but it's, it's, I believe we're under the, all the emails come from the TNC. So, so everybody's involved, but it's not, it's not a state body. So I think we're, I think we're the science advisory team for TNC, I think. I, I apologize, I get too confused. I want too many of these things. And I think it's called the science, I think it's called the science advisory committee. I think, I think it's a SAC, it's not a TAC or whatever. There's too many of these things, that I, so I apologize, I forget. But, 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 but a great point of entry for you guys is the Ormond Beach Task Force. That is the community uh, entrance, and that's where anybody can go, open to everyone. Um, also, with many of these issues, as you guys have probably discovered with the, with the mountain lion hearing and all this and that, there might be some agency doing something. We do not have anywhere near the money that we need to do this stuff, right? A lot of the key stuff, like a gateway park, all that kind of stuff, you have to have a lot of money to have a consulting firm do that. Much of that stuff is totally, totally within your guy's wheelhouse right now, right now. Awesome, awesome capstone projects, awesome independent study projects, awesome projects to do with Dr. Reinemann. Really, really cool stuff where would, would people like an entrance park, right? That kind of stuff. Perfect thing. That's totally within your guy's wheelhouse. And that could, those, those things turn out to be really, really helpful in laying the groundwork for this other stuff. Because again, people don't know, we'll do a, we'll do a gateway park and people come to a meeting and we say some stuff, but, but doing more of the legwork is awesome for you guys to get to really understand the situation. But all, very, very frequently that stuff goes directly into the plans of, of the, the restoration or the, the design, um, conceptual designs or whatever, so cool. Anything else? Yeah, one last, are you optimistic about the future health of this 
ecosystem? Totally. Totally. So this is this is this is going to be the crown jewel, probably of Southern California wetland restoration, uh, for dealing with sea level rise. Everywhere else, thanks for saying that. I should have shown a better picture. Maybe like, um, yeah. I mean, this one works. This one works. This one works. These all work. Everywhere else, Biona wetlands. The wetlands in San Diego, with, with, the, with the exception of Tijuana Estuary. Uh, uh, everywhere else, constrained. We have this so-called coastal squeeze. Sea level is coming up. It's totally coming up. But we have PCH behind most of our wetlands. We have a shopping mall behind most of these wetlands. We have a city or whatever it is. So there's not a lot of place where the wetland can run to. Here, it can run into all these ag fields, right? So we actually can design it so that one, it works now, and also, in the coming decades, as it evolves, as the system geomorphologically evolves, ecologically evolves, it can keep going and we can keep the critters, the plants and animals. Unlike a lot of our other sites, they're going to become bathtub rings. And those ecosystems are going to be super, super narrow. So I'm really optimistic. I'm, I'm not optimistic we're going to have something going in a year or two or three or four. But long term, very optimistic. It's, it's, it's totally going to happen. Um, and so yeah, so it's, it's one of the neat things that we can, we'll be able to look back on, I think, and say, look at this cool example of effective management.